Welcome to this program entitled Riding the Wave, Differentiating Bispecifics and CAR T-cell Therapies for Relapsed and Refractory Multiple Myeloma. My name is Dr. Joseph McHale. I'm a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute and the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. Today, joining me is a very dear friend and colleague, marie vie Victoria Mateos, who is a professor of hematology and the head of the myeloma unit at the University Hospital of Salamanca in Salamanca, Spain. So good to have you join me, marie vie Thank you very much, Dr. Mikhail, and it is actually a great pleasure to participate in this event with you. Here we have the disclosures for us for this program. And just a few housekeeping notes before we dive into uh, this great topic. Um, if you haven't already completed your pre-survey, please do so by clicking on the link below the video or scanning uh, the QR code that's shown here. And let us know who you are uh, in those polling questions that will be coming up. Also, be sure to complete your evaluation at the end of the session so you'll be able to claim your CME, and I'll remind you of that at the end. I want to note that this is an activity that's jointly uh, provided by Global Education Group and Bonham CE, and it is supported by an independent education grant from Janssen and Pfizer. So over the coming weeks, be sure to watch our handles uh, for additional myeloma programs and CE, CE programming. So make sure you follow at Bonham CE for more CME certified programs. And of course, the two Twitter handles or X handles that Marie V and I have at J MD and at MVM Mateos. So lastly, by virtue of our learning objectives for our time together, we would anticipate that at the completion of this educational activity, participants should be able to do three things. Differentiate pivotal trial results of current and emerging BCMA-directed therapies for relapsed refractory myeloma, including one that's not even BCMA-directed that we'll be discussing. Also to translate strategies to monitor and minimize the negative impact of treatment-related toxicities uh, for these therapies that we'll be discussing at length today. And then lastly, and very importantly, determining the appropriate therapy based on patient characteristics, the efficacy and the safety data that we'll discuss, along with risk assessment and the treatment history for patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. I really think this is addressing a challenging discussion that we have now around when to use bispecifics, when to use CAR-Ts, and which ones to use. I'm now going to turn it over to my uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Mateos, to walk us through some introduction around these great therapies. Marivi? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mikhail. And uh, first of all, I would like to put in context uh, that uh, FDA approved and uh, the MCCN guidelines also recommended two products based on CAR T cell therapy targeting BCMA, Silta Capta gene auto cell, Filta cell, as well as uh, ID Capta gene big cell, ID cell, and other two biospecific monoclonal antibodies. Erranatamaba and Clistamaba. And the approval is basically based for relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma after at least four prior lines of therapy, including proteasome inhibitor, immunomodulatory drug, and anti CD38 monoclonal antibody. The mechanism of action of CAR T cells and bi specific monoclonal antibody is a bit different. Basically, CAR T cells are T cells modified enhancing a chimeric antigen receptor today against the BCMA. These CAR T cells are going to target the myeloma cell and releasing a lot of cytokines, resulting in the killing of the plasma cells. The bi-specific monoclonal antibodies are going to redirect the T lymphocytes not genetically modified into the tumor niche. These T cells are going to release also a lot of cytokines, and the final result is also the apoptosis of the plasma cell. You have to know that together with the BCMA, we have also a new targeted GPRC5D with a bi-specific monoclonal antibody also approved by FDA in the same indication. If we briefly focus on the rationale for the approval of these compounds, we can start with l as well as teclistamaba. BCMA by specific monoclonal antibodies conducted in studies of patients heavily pretreated. The median number of prior lines of therapy was five, and important to note how over 80% of the patients were 
triple class refractory. In this situation, when we evaluate the efficacy, the overall response rate is over 60% for both ranatamab and teclistamab. The complete response rate is between 35 and up to 46%. And important to note how majority of the patients in complete response are in minimal residual disease negative. Median progression free survival is around one year. And I would say that overall survival is not mature yet, and we have to wait in order to see longer follow-up. In terms of safety profile, we have to remark two important toxicities. The first one is the cytokine release syndrome, that with the bi-specific monoclonal antibodies, the CRS is lower than the CRS we are going to see with car -Ts. It is present in between 60-70% of the patients, but basically there is no patients developing grade 3, 4, cytokine release syndrome. And the other important toxicity is immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity that with biospecific monoclonal antibodies is present in no more than 3% of the patients. And in all patients, this neurotoxicity is only grade one and two. What is the rationale for the approval of the BCMA car -Ts, ID cell and filter cell? Basically, again, series of heavily pretreated myeloma patients. The median number of prior lines of therapy was six, but again, over 80% of the patients were triple class refractory. I would say this is the common denominator to this BCMA targeted therapy. And in terms of efficacy, filter cell, we observed how basically all patients responded and 83% of the patients achieved the complete response and the median progression for survival of almost three years is something exciting for this triple class refractory population. ID cell showed to be effective with overall response rate 73 complete response 33%. The median PFS is a bit shorter in comparison with the Zilta cell, approximately nine months, and median overall survival two years. In terms of a safety profile, as I previously said, the cytokine release syndrome is more frequent with both ID cell and Zilta cell present in over 70% of the patients. And although it is not very frequent, we can have some patients developing grade 3 or grade 4 cytokine release syndrome. Concerning neurotoxicity and especially immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity is a bit more frequent in comparison with bi-specific monoclonal antibodies around 20%, but it's true that in majority of the patients, this neurotoxicity is only grade one and two, and it is quite manageable. And I would say that these are the efficacy and safety data that had been the rationale for the approval of these compounds by FDA in the triple class refractory population. Well, thank you so much. What a, a fantastic summary of a lot of data, uh, but also, as you mentioned, very exciting data. I mean, these are patients where historically um, novel agents may have had a response rate of 20, 25%, and now we're seeing over 80, 90% of patients respond, and indeed, uh, with these very deep and durable remissions uh, with CAR-T and with bispecifics. So why don't we move to a case, um, IV, that I'll present um, to, to, to put this in context of uh, real life uh, patients. So this is Hallie, a 68 year old African American woman. We know that myeloma, of course, affects African Americans at twice the incidence of Caucasian individuals. And now we're seeing her because she has had four prior lines of therapy. She has multiple myeloma, which was RISS stage two, but interestingly, she also has the translocation 1114, which is also actually more common within African Americans. Her son is her caregiver. Unfortunately, she was not able to enter a clinical trial because she previously had breast cancer that excluded her, but she's willing to travel for her therapies. She has comorbidities commonly of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. We can see her numbers here. Perhaps importantly, her creatinine is 1.8 with a creatinine clearance of 40, but her hemoglobin is 11 and her platelets are 127 neutrophils being 2.7. So previously she was treated with bortezomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and a transplant, went on to lenalidomide maintenance, and that gave her four years, which is approximately the average. 
She then went on to daratumumab plus carfilzomib, which gave her another two years of progression-free survival, but she progressed sadly, was given pomalidomide with bortezomib that lasted about 13 months, and then most recently, venetoclax and dexamethasone in light of her translocation 1114. But unfortunately, she's now progressing seven to eight months after that. So as we think of these options, as you've listed to us, of the two CAR T cells of idacaptogene veclusol and siltacaptogene odalusol, uh, the two bispecific antibodies, teclistamab and alronatumab that target BCMA and possibly even telquetumab. Um, I, I think this is a very relevant case for our discussion today. Yeah, sure, Joanne. According to what I previously said, this patient has received the four prior lines of therapy and exposed to proteasome inhibitor imid anti cd 38 monoclonal antibody refractory to the last line of therapy. And I would like to discuss it with you what would be your recommendation for this patient, a CAR T versus bi specific monoclonal antibody, and what are the patient and or disease based factors that you consider in order to select CAR T versus bi specific monoclonal antibody? No, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question. <clears throat> this is the kind of question that I often say, if I ask 10 myeloma doctors, I'll have 12 answers because people do feel differently a little bit about them. Um, you demonstrated very clearly, these are both highly effective strategies. And I think for this particular case, Honestly, both of them are available. She does have some degree of renal insufficiency, but we have been much more comfortable giving both CAR T and bi specifics, at least in this moderate renal insufficiency. If she had very advanced renal dysfunction on dialysis, that would be more challenging. Although there was some recent work demonstrating that we can do CAR T cell therapies in patients on dialysis. I guess in this kind of context, I may slightly favor going to CAR-T because we saw the deeper and more durable uh, responses with CAR-T. She did say she was willing to go to an academic center where typically CAR-T is had. <clears throat> and although, as we'll discuss later, there are some access issues, in general, if someone has the capacity to get a CAR-T, whether it is IDA-cell or SILTA-cell, I tend to favor that unless there is a... a uh, a factor that really excludes them from CAR T, as we've mentioned with the renal failure, the inability to travel, being very frail, or if their disease is relapsing just so quickly that we don't have that bridging opportunity in that period of time because the collection of the T cells and the manufacturing may take up to eight weeks. And so I want to make sure that she's covered. So assuming that her relapse isn't very quickly, I might favor a CAR T, but I'm open to your thoughts as well, Nanivi. No, I completely agree. And I was going to say that the only factor it is pending is the aggressiveness of the disease. And if the disease would be very aggressive, rapidly progressing, in which, well, it would not be possible to maintain the disease under control during the manufacturing time, and this would be the case in order to select either teclistamab or erronatamab, because, as you know, the bi-specific monoclonal antibodies are off-the-shelf drugs available to be used immediately. But the familiar and the social support is present in this patient, so I completely agree with you. And if the disease is not very aggressive, maybe CAR-T would be the best choice. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think we agree on this. And I think actually there's another case that really even further illustrates some of this detail. And I'll let you present this next case. Robert is a 71-year-old white male. He has an IgA kappa multiple myeloma, RISS3 with deletion 17P. He lives alone. He does not have a caregiver and has comorbidities type 2 diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, performance stage one, in general, good bone marrow reserve, and also good renal function with creatinine clearance 62. This patient has received five prior lines of therapy, including Dara Lendex as a first choice, pomalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone second line, isatuximab, carfilzomib, and dexamethasone third line, Selinexor plus dexamethasone, the fourth line, and this patient had the opportunity to receive already the clistamab, but progressed one year later. So the options for the sixth line of therapy for this 71-year-old white male would be alquetamab targeting GPRC5D, IDCell, filtacell, 
the clistamab again, l ranatamab or other possibilities. So this uh, patient represents, I would say, an additional step to the patient we have just discussed because this patient has been previously treated with BCMA targeted therapy, in this case, teclistamab. No, absolutely. And, and I think it does raise that important question. You know, we talked earlier about differentiating going to CAR-T or bispecific, but what if someone has already had a BCMA strategy? And I think the data is emerging that we can indeed go from BCMA to BCMA. We, we've taken people from Idacel to Siltacel. We've taken people from previous use of, of Belantamab to any of these options. So I don't, I never, I never exclude everything, anything based on the target because we know the BCMA target is maybe a little bit different than let's say CD38, where I'm not very comfortable going immediately from one CD38 to another. That being said, probably the place that I'm the least comfortable going BCMA to BCMA is from a bispecific to CAR-T because when someone's been on a bispecific as he has for these last 11 months, it may be difficult to collect his T cells. But what do you think, Marie V? Is, is, that, is that the way you think about it as well? Or do you have a different strategy? No, Anna, for me, the sequencing of these novel immunotherapies is uh, the challenging situation we are facing right now. And from my point of view, we have to consider the target, BCMA versus GPR, C5D. And we have also maybe to include the T cell function. Considering the target, is true that after BCMA targeted therapy, there are some patients in which uh, there is a loss of expression of BCMA. This is the same applicable to GPRC5D. And uh, with the data we have right now, I think that this is more frequent for GPRC5D than after BCMA. This means that uh, a possibility would be to continue with the BCMA. So in this patient treated with teclistamab, maybe it would be possible to switch to another target to go to GPR C5D and to try to utilize the bi-specific monoclonal antibody talquetamab. And I don't know if you wanted to comment something about the data we have with talquetamab in the heavily treated myeloma patients, even including patients already treated with BCMA targeted therapy. Uh, a great segue. And, and by the way, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think we are learning, you know, one of the great benefits of CAR-T is that it's really that one and done therapy. The patient gets treated and then they have that period uh, off treatment. And I think we're going to be learning, as you said nicely, a lot about T-cell health, um, if I can call it that. I've never seen more lectures on T-cell health than in the last few months as we understand t but, but in this patient, I agree. I think moving towards a different target, a GPRC5D is valid. And it's really based on um, the study of the Monumental One study, which looked at a bispecific antibody that now, instead of hooking on to BCMA, it hooks on to GPRC5D, as we've said, um, and uh, at the same time onto the CD3 antigen on the T cell. And this was an important study because different cohorts were looked at. These patients were very heavily pretreated. Almost all of them were triple class refractory and some even penta drug refractory. But we even did look at patients that had prior T cell redirection. And so again, very impressive response rates, about 70% of all patients treated on this trial. Those who were treated, as you can see here with the 0.4 milligram per kilogram, a response rate of 74%, we saw 72% at the higher dose, but the higher dose of 0.8 is given Q2 weekly, which is an advantage to give patients treatment less often. And in the smaller cohort, granted only 51 patients, but very reassuring to me in a patient like this man who'd had a previous T-cell redirection therapy, still had a response rate of 65%. So still, you know, twice as high as what we've seen historically with other therapies. And uh, that being said, every drug comes with toxicity. And I know you're going to share with us a little bit more about toxicity, but because now we're targeting GPRC5D, we do see different kinds of toxicities because GPRC5D is expressed 
on some skin cells, nail cells, and in the taste buds. And so these patients do also experience the side effects you've mentioned primarily of CRS and neurological toxicities, but now we have new ones, namely the dyskesia, which can be very difficult as people lose their taste and their sense of taste. We see some skin changes, some nail changes, and even rash with particular dry mouth that I want to comment on because uh, although we're still sorting out the details of these toxicities and understanding them better, how to ideally manage them both with supportive of care and with dose adjustment, um, this is something relatively new to us. These are not the kinds of toxicities we've historically seen before. But nonetheless, I think the take-home message here is that we have a new target. It can be used after patients have had a BCMA-directed therapy uh, with very impressive response rates in that 65 to 75% range, uh, as we've discussed before. Well, why don't I move to our third and final case uh, which I think is going to uh, illustrate uh, the fact that although we've talked a lot about the efficacy of these drugs, we've talked about the more shorter term toxicities of cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicities, although some of them can be longer term, and the ones that are specifically GPRC5D related, I think it's important for us to recognize, as you mentioned earlier on, uh, Marie-V, that as we treat pa patients with these drugs, they do become very heavily immunosuppressed. And there can be some significant risks, both short-term and in particular long-term with infections. And it's a tragedy to see a patient have such a beautiful response and then to be to succumb to a, a, a preventable or even treatable infection. Um, and so I think this case illustrates a little bit of the importance of that. So Isabel is a 58-year-old Hispanic female. We know that the average age of diagnosis of myeloma is around 70, but it's actually considerably younger in Hispanic individuals. And she's now had four prior lines of therapy with RSS stage two myeloma. She does not have high-risk genetics. She's about 75 miles away from a cancer center, but has great support from her two daughters. And she liked as much as possibly treated closer to home, doesn't want to have to go into the hospital too frequently. She has type 2 diabetes and peripheral neuropathy. And interestingly and importantly for this discussion, she has had repeated COVID-19 infections, which is not surprising in our population of patients who are so heavily treated and immunosuppressed. Furthermore, she also has borderline renal function with a creatin clearance, albeit of 40. So I think as we discussed before, that keeps options open. She was treated with a VRD and a transplant with lenalidomide maintenance. And then after progression was given isotuximab carfilzomib dex, which gave her a little over two years, which is great. But now, unfortunately, we can see her disease becoming more aggressive. She's progressed now on elotuzumab palm dex and most recently to selenexor and dexamethasone. So as we think about this, we know that prolonged cytopenias and hypogammaglobinemia and just infection risk in general, in general is quite high with both CAR T and BI specifics. And how do you think about this and how do you approach this in your patients, Marie-V? Well, I would say that this is not easy. In principle, the patient would be eligible for whatever BCMA CAR T or BCMA BI specific monoclonal antibody. But if we focus on infections, it's true that I think that the risk is higher even with the BCMA by specific monoclonal antibodies than with the BCMA CAR T. Or maybe, although the frequency of the rate can be similar, I would say that with the bi specific monoclonal antibodies, as the treatment is continuous, the probability of developing severe infections is more constant throughout the therapy. Whilst if we prescribe a CAR T, is to that the infection risk does exist, but it is restricted to the first months. And once the cytopenias are recovered and the TCD4 lymphocytes are recovered, the risk of infection significantly decreases. So based on this, I would say that maybe this patient would be eligible for CAR-T, explaining, of course, that the risk of infections does exist, but it is more restricted to the beginning. However, while we incorporate the social history and she would like to be treated as much as possible at home or near her home, well, I would say that CAR-T includes the, uh, the fact that the patient has to travel to a cancer center, 
in order to deliver the CAR T, whilst the bi-specific monoclonal antibodies are delivered, I would say, in a non-A-specific or a specialized cancer center. But it's true that the CAR T is just a single infusion, and if we explain clearly to the patient that we will require it to be closer to the hospital and maybe hospitalized just for a month or one and a half month, and later on the patient is going to be treatment free and maybe also this is free. I think that this can make the consideration in order to select for this patient a CAR T. And of course, another possibility that we could discuss is the use of talquetamab because talquetamab is not targeting BCMA, but the GPRC5D. And we know that the risk of infections is lower in comparison with the BCMA targeted therapy. And this would be another possibility. As you previously said, 0.8 milligrams per kilo every other week. I think that it is more convenient for the patient and this would be another possibility. I completely agree. I mean, I think you've you've captured it very well. Um, uh, the the beauty of being able to have the one and done, you know, typically here in the U.S., of course, now we're still seeing most of the therapy of a bispecific being done in an academic center, which could even have her have to travel more, although we are hoping to integrate it into the community further. Do you have any other thoughts on uh, infections in general? Uh, before we get towards the end here, marie -V. Yes, of course, uh, I would like to summarize uh, saying that uh, infections uh, is uh, an important adverse event we have to consider when we treat the patients with uh, either CAR T or bi-specific monoclonal antibodies, but we have uh, to incorporate also the target. And as I previously said, if we decide to target GPRC5D in the monumental one study, the incidence of infections was lower in comparison with the BCMA targeted therapy. And the incidence of infections overall is not higher than 50-60% and a few patients develop grade 3-4 infections. When we focus on the BCMA targeted therapy, I think that the infection risk and the infection rate is higher with both bi-specific monoclonal antibodies as well as CAR T's. But as I previously said, I think that the risk for infections after bi-specific monoclonal antibodies does occur across the treatment because the treatment is given as continuous therapy. It's true that new approaches is in order to optimize the dose and schedule of administration are ongoing in order to reduce the incidence of infections, but we have to consider that we can have patients with grade 3-4 infections and therefore adequate prophylaxis should be taken into consideration. The same is applicable to CAR T's, but I would say that the infections are restricted to the first months. So I think that it is more easy from my point of view to manage this infection risk with the adequate prophylaxis. If we consider the hematological toxicity in terms of neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, I would say that the incidence of both hematological toxicity is in principle higher for patients receiving BCMA CAR T's than with bi-specific monoclonal antibodies. But I think that this is maybe because of the lymphodepletion. And overall, I would say that the hematological toxicity is manageable across all modalities, BCMA, GBRC5D, and it is possible to use a GCSF in order to manage these cytopenias, taking into consideration that during the cytokine release syndrome period, if possible, it is better to avoid the use of GCSF and so on. And another important adverse event that it is also in relation with the infection risk is hypogamma globulinemia. This is something that we see with the BCMA CAR T, with BCMA by specific monoclonal antibodies, and even with the GPRC5D. But you know that the BCMA is involved in the production of normal immunoglobulins. So we prescribe by specific monoclonal antibodies as continuous therapy, severe hypogamma globulinemia, 
is going to be observed and the recommendation is to support with IV or sub-Q immunoglobulins. We see the same effect with CAR-Ts, but restricted to the first months and one of the Humoral immunity is recovered. We see normal immunoglobulins. And with GBRC5D, we see also hypogamma globulinemia, but I would say that the incidence is lower than with the BCMA targeted therapy. And finally, to say that why infections are more frequent with these CAR T's as well as by specific monoclonal antibodies, because definitely we have to consider patient-related factors, myeloma does usually affect the elderly population with comorbidities. In addition, we have to consider treatment-related factors, and majority of these patients are heavily pretreated, and they do present cellular and humoral immunosuppression. We have to consider the infection history as well as the disease-related factors like high tumor burden, poorly controlled disease, as well as the renal impairment we see in many cases, as we had the opportunity to see in the clinical cases we have discussed. So we have to consider all these factors in order to explain why infections are more frequent, and therefore we have to consider the adequate prophylaxis. No, I think you've summarized that beautifully. And, and that adequate prophylaxis is really what we're trying to determine right now. And I think guidelines are on the way soon to really guide us as to when do we use IVIG? When do we use prophylactic antibodies, uh, antibiotics? When do we use the GCSF, as you've mentioned? And I think that'll be helpful. In, in that vein, uh, Marie-V, before we wrap up, you know, we've often excluded patients from autologous stem cell transplant as they become older and more frail with comorbidities. What are your thoughts about using BCMA-directed therapies like CAR T and biospecifics in more frail or elderly patients? Well, I would say that the chronological age should not be a factor in order to consider the eligibility for either CAR T or biospecific monoclonal antibodies. But when we have a look to the median age of the patients included in the different clinical trials, it's true that the patients included in the clinical trials with CAR T are younger than those included in the biospecific monoclonal antibodies. I would consider more the frailty score, and maybe the presence of comorbidities in order to select the CAR T or bispecific monoclonal antibodies. And I think that bispecific monoclonal antibodies will be, I would say, more available for more frail patients and with some comorbidities in comparison with the BCMA CAR Ts. And I would like to discuss you about the disparities because we know that now the disparities are more and more taken into consideration in the clinical trials. Can you discuss something about the access to CAR T cell therapy and by specific monoclonal antibodies in the different subgroup of patients? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is an area of my work that I'm very interested in and spend much of my time now in, in health disparities and myeloma. And we could discuss this at length, that it's a very complicated problem. But unfortunately, it is continually highlighted now, even with CAR T and bispecifics, that there are populations, primarily the African American population, as well as the Hispanic population, but also uh, individuals who are more economically disadvantaged. We know all of these factors contribute to access to therapy in myeloma in general, but now also, unfortunately, to access to CAR T and bispecifics. A lot of that has to do with access to that specialized care at an academic center or in a larger center, but also just in general. And I think it's something that we have to be very aware of. Uh, hopefully we're starting to improve the production of slots in CAR T cell therapy, and that may be helping a little bit, but I think all of us being more aware of it, recognizing the appropriate nature of how we care for patients in a culturally sensitive and appropriate manner uh, can really bridge that gap and reduce the disparity that we see to increase access to patients across the board. Well, this has just been an extraordinary discussion, uh, Marie-V. I'm going to just wrap up by saying 
You know, there are key differences as we've shared today around BCMA directed therapies, whether it's CAR T or bispecific antibodies. In CAR T cell therapy, you know, it's that one and done, but it does take six to eight weeks for the production. So we have to be aware of that. There are still challenges with slots, as I've mentioned. Centers have to be very well certified, but most patients do spend a period of time in a hospital up to about a month, depending, sometimes even shorter than that. Whereas with biospecific antibodies, this is just off the shelf. We can just give it to patients right away. We don't have to have slots per se, but most centers are still having a component of admission to hospital and that's being sorted out. Some of us are working towards fully outpatient approaches, uh, but because of that risk of cytokine release syndrome, in particular grade three, albeit very low, there are still strategies with step-up dosing to be able uh, to uh, give patients uh, a period of time in hospital. And hopefully, as I say, we'll reduce that with time. So as we look to the future, you know, BCMA and now GPRC5D targeted therapies have shown to us unprecedented response rates lasting a long time, but we still have a lot of questions as we've discussed today. How do we get access to therapy for more patients? Will we be using these therapies earlier in the disease course? What is the right sequencing? Do we go from BCMA to BCMA or do we switch targets? And indeed, now we're starting to see combination therapies that are probably going to revolutionize the way we treat myeloma. And per se, we may even be able to replace autologous stem cell transplant and other strategies early on the disease course. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, in particular, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Mateos. It's such a pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you for uh, being with us today. Uh, and I do want to make sure to remind everyone that you can claim your CME credit by completing the post-survey and evaluation that is in the link below or following the QR code. We really appreciate you joining us, and we trust that this has been helpful to you as you care for your patients with multiple myeloma. Thank you very much.